Okay. Thank you very much, um, dear, dear Andrea, for, for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to, um, to speak today to, about such an um, interesting and uh, timely um, topic. I welcome everybody. Um, as uh, Professor Telsi just mentioned, I'm an economist at the um, Swiss National Bank. So the Swiss National Bank in, in Switzerland is not the supervisory authority over banks. Um, we have the Financial Market Authority in Bern that is um, supervising banks, but the Swiss National Bank has a mandate to contribute to financial stability. Um, and this is what, what my team and I, what we do, we analyze the, the Swiss financial system and um, try to make sure that financial crises uh, do not uh, happen again or um, yes and today i would like to talk about um, banking regulation um, and in times of the COVID 19 um, crisis and as a, as a disclaimer um, i'm speaking here as well, my opinions are um, not necessarily those of the um, swiss national bank next slide please okay so <clears throat> i first gonna talk a little bit about banks. So this is gonna be an introductory. Um, why, why are banks so important in our economy and why do we regulate them? Um, in a second step, I will talk about capital regulation. That is one dimension of, of how to regulate banks. And we will look at two different frameworks here. First, the, the so-called um, unweighted leverage ratio framework. And second, we will have a look at the risk-weighted um, framework. And then once we have these these bases, um, we will uh, we will have a look at, at the COVID nineteen crisis. How does this crisis affect banks? And we will look at what what's going on in, in Switzerland. Next, please. Okay, so very um, first principles. What is special about banks? Um, many people um, when they think about a bank have something like a custodian a safe um, in mind what you see here on the on the right um, a safe is a place where you can bring your your valuables your your cash or your 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 um, your securities if they're in paper form or your your gold um, but that's not what 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 banks are um, uh, what what the core 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 element of, of banks are banks are not storing storing your your money Banks are also not um, not like an investment fund. They are not taking your money and using it to buy, for example, securities. So in the middle, we see the a simplified balance sheet of an investment fund. So in, banks might provide access to, to investment funds. So many banks um, sell investment funds um, and they, they issue shares. So this investment fund issues shares. You can buy these shares and then the value of your shares depends on on whatever assets the investment fund holds on the asset side. So in this case, for example, cash, bonds, or securities. But again, this is not what a bank is doing. The bank is not taking your money and investing it somewhere. But the key 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 element of, of, of a bank, that's what you see on the left, um, is that a bank creates new deposits through credit. So a bank grants loans to households or or firms or the government and thereby extends its balance sheet. So you get new assets, um, new loans on the asset side and new deposits on the liability side. And what we call call money, um, what is an asset for us is an accounting liability um, for the bank. So here on the left, this is a very stylized and simple um, balance sheet of a typical um, bank. On the asset side, you have central bank reserves. In this case, it's a Swiss bank with Swiss national bank reserves. Then you have other liquidity and other assets, like for example, government bonds. And then the large part of a typical commercial bank is these days is mortgages and, and, and other loans. And on the liability side, you have uh, mostly um, deposits, other liabilities like bonds. And, and then there's a small fraction called equity that we're gonna, um, talk a lot about um, today. Okay, so key takeaway, money is created through banks. 
and the value of your money, so these deposits, depends crucially on what the bank does on the asset side. Okay, and there we see from the very beginning, we see a fundamental uh, tension because people hold money because they want to have something safe. Uh, they want a safe asset and money is something like a, it's a public good and public infrastructure. Every, everybody pays wages in, in money. You receive uh, income in money, but this crucially depends on what the bank is doing on the asset side. Um, next slide, please. So what, what could possibly go wrong? Um, here we, we look at, um, at two banks. We have bank A and bank B, stylized balance sheets. And one of the customers of bank A wants to transfer some money from bank A to bank B. Okay, what, what typically happens is that both banks have accounts at the central bank. So these reserves in blue, um, they are registered at the Swiss National Bank, at the Federal Reserve, at the European Central Bank. Um, and then the balance sheet of bank A shrinks by 10 on both sides and the, and the balance sheet of bank B increases by 10 on both sides. So the, the Swiss National Bank just says, okay, bank A now has 10 million um, less Swiss francs on, on our account and bank B has 10 million um, more. But as you can see here, um, we have way, the, the, the green bar is way larger than the blue bar, okay? That's, that's basically why, why banks are prone to, to bank runs, okay? If, what happens if more, if more customers want to, want to transfer their money to other banks, then eventually bank A runs into trouble, okay? Because they only have reserves of amounting to 20 and all the other assets, they are, in this case, they are loans, they are long-term loans and bank A cannot simply shift them to another bank or, <clears throat> or liquidate them within a day. Um, so the key, key point here is that banks are subject to, to bank runs and they face um, liquidity constraints that, are, that, are, that, are, that occur because of this maturity mismatch between the asset and the liability side. Okay, the deposits, so what we call money, we can use it every day. You can go to your bank tomorrow and say, I want to transfer my money. Whereas the loans on the asset side, they are long-term. These days, as I said, it's mostly mortgages over five or 10 years. And this can, can put a lot of pressure or stress in, in, the, in the financial system. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and then another problem that, that can occur as I, as I mentioned earlier, our money is backed by, backed by loans. Um, and what happens if, if the bank was not very prudent in providing these loans? So in this case, we assume that this bank has to write off loans amounting to 20 say 20, um, 20 million um, Swiss francs, or let's better make it 20 billion, that's more realistic. Um, what happens to the balance sheet? As I mentioned before, equity here is a crucial component. Equity is basically the difference between all the assets and the, and the liabilities. And if, if a bank has to write off loans, equity is hit first. Okay, so it's the equity holders that suffer losses first and, there, and then afterwards, um, if there's not enough equity, you, the, the bank ends up being insolvent. And in this case, you see that on the right-hand side, the assets are then way smaller than all the liabilities, all these deposits. And the question is what, what happens, okay? So it's, it's crucial, the amount of equity here is it's crucial to, to, um, to see how much, how, how, what kind of shocks can banks absorb? Okay, if a shock of five, five billion here would not be that much of a problem. Equity would, would uh, decrease by five, could be um, the bank would still survive, but um, a large shock as indicated here by 20 is putting this bank to insolvency. And then all these depositors, all these kind of ordinary people who just, um, I exaggerate, they go to work, they just want to have their money, their safe, safe financial asset on some bank account, they are hurt as well. Uh, next slide, please. So let me summarize so far what, what makes the banking system inherently fragile. It's on the one hand that we have this um, reliance on short-term deposits. Um, 
that can cause liquidity problems and also bank runs. And we have the an overall high indebtedness in the banking service system that can cause distress and insolvency. These are probably the two most uh, crucial elements. Of course, there are a variety of other dimensions um, regarding banking or financial stability. I will just mention a few. Um, interconnectedness um, has, has been a big problem in the past. In 2008, you have all seen these cartoons of, of domino banks. One bank fall, falls after another because banks grant loans amongst each, uh, each other and to other non-bank financial companies. So there are huge interlinkages. Um, then you might have um, governance issues. Um, obviously a bank does, uh, the, the management of a bank is not interested in, in a bankruptcy tomorrow, but if you're a CEO and you, you do not intend to run for a second um, round and your term ends in four years, you might not care too much if all those long-term assets maturing in 10 years are, are extremely safe. And then you've also um, potentially these distressed um, sales, as we have seen, seen before with the um, liquidity um, problem typically, also now what we're gonna see later with a corona shock, some external shock hits and then everybody tries to sell at the same time and then prices collapse collectively um, and you can have these downward um, spirals. So against the backdrop of these inherent fragilities the goal of banking regulation, put very simply, is to try to make sure that banks are able to support the real economy and that creditors or taxpayers are, are protected in, in, times of, in times of stress. Okay, and this bank supporting the real economy, I mean, this is, of, of course, a key element, and you might have discussed it in, in your lecture. So if you read from, from Keynes to Scampeter to, to Caldor, the banks being able to extend credit um, is a core element of, of, of modern um, civilization, of, of, of capitalism, um, because only through this liquidity expansion have we been able to, to increase um, investments. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> and in the past, over the last hundreds of years, there have been many instances where people, depositors, they lost their money. And that's why governments came up with a variety of, of measures to try to make the system more resilient. So one of the explicit safety nets and what probably the most, uh, most, most known um, is, is the deposit protection um, scheme. So many, many advanced, most advanced economies these days, they have a deposit, deposit insurance um, program. Here I provide the example of, of Switzerland. Um, the idea is very simple here on the right hand side again we have our our bank that provided a many bad loans maybe to to no income no job people and they didn't do their due diligence properly or think of um, somebody like like deutsche bank granting many loans to ireland or southern europe before 2008 not really um, thoroughly investigating the credit worthiness of these um, borrowers so then they have to write off these loans and if this happens, the deposit protection scheme tells you um, how, to, how, to, how to distribute the remaining assets. And the key idea is to save, to protect ordinary um, people. So in the case of Switzerland, the, the level one of the safety net says that every bank account up to 100,000 franc will first be served out of the liquid assets that a bank has. So on the right-hand side, the, in, in the case of Switzerland, if a bank goes bankrupt, then the financial market authority will basically take over this bank. They will look at all the depositors, um, see how many depositors have bank, bank balances up to 100,000K, and then will, they will look at the, the, the asset side of the bank and use the reserves and other liquid assets to, um, to, pay, to pay these depositors. And if this is not enough, then there's a level two protection, um, a so-called depositor protection scheme in, in Switzerland, which is a bit typical about Switzerland. That's not an, a governmentally imposed regulation, but it's a so-called safe self-regulation. So banks um, came together and every bank pays a certain amount into one, one basket. And in, in, in case of, of stress, then um, the, the, this, this bank that is um, running Insolvent 
can can draw liquidity out of this um, common basket. And then there's a third level, which basically says that um, remaining assets here are treated um, in such a way that that um, that deposit holders have a high seniority. So a, a, a real balance sheet of a bank looks a bit more more complicated on the liability side. You might have variety of different bonds um, with different seniorities, um, which means that if the bank goes bankrupt, some people get their money first. If they have received all their money, then there's a second tranche, a third tranche, etc. And this level three also ensures that um, depositors have a high um, seniority. Um, and maybe just a short note, it's um, I think very interesting to see historically where these deposit um, schemes come from. So in Switzerland, the first first scheme has been implemented in 1930, but then almost nothing happened until 1991 when a bank went bankrupt in Switzerland and it turned out that the pre-existing um, system was not very safe. And then, um, then the government came up improving the system. And then again, after 2008, the Swiss government improved the um, the regulation and um, and now banks have to hold sufficient amount of relatively safe assets denominated also in Swiss francs um, so that they can be liquidated relatively um, easily. And Andrea mentioned that some of you are interested in, in green or climate, climate issues. So I can only encourage you to, for example, look at the um, United States um, deposit insurance scheme, which was implemented, I think in 1931 or so. Um, during a time when a huge environmental disaster hit, so the so-called Dust Bowl, maybe just one sentence on this, <laughs> if you hold on with me. So um, you had a, an expansion of, of agriculture, um, monoculture in, in many states in the United States, um, which was not sustainable. So um, a few dry winter hit and the soil was so dry that the wind basically blew all the soil away and hundreds of thousands of people lost their, their income, um, their harvests. And the point is that many banks provided loans for these agricultural, uh, for these farming activities and all these banks went bankrupt and all the money holders, all the depositors also lost their um, deposit because there was no deposit insurance in place. This also to some extent motivated the deposit insurance scheme that is in place in the United States um, today. Next slide, please. And then once we, now we talk about an, an explicit safety net. And then the problem with banks is that you have this implicit safety net. I mean, there are yeah, these articles that many banks before 2008, they just, they, some of them knew that their activity was risky, but they said everybody else is doing the same thing. And if, if things go really bad, then the government is going to, to rescue us anyway. So here we see the, the government rescue packages to the financial sector during the global financial crisis. Um, and we see that they have been um, relatively large. Governments injected capital directly to banks. They, in some instances, purchased assets. So you might have heard of these bad banks. So in many cases, the government um, bought bad loans, non-performing loans from banks' balance sheets, and thereby rescued the bank. Another very popular measure are guarantees. Um, for example, the Swiss government reg regarding UBS and many other governments, they provided guarantees so that um, investors and deposit holders knew that their money was, was safe because the government said, we're going to guarantee for, for this to avoid, avoid further um, meltdown. But of course, after 2008, after all these rescue packages, um, people were not very happy about it. And, and the government was under pressure to, to improve banking regulation. And if you want to get a, a quick overview of, of how banking regulation um, looks like, then we can have a look at the next slide, <laughs> which is, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, which is very large and looks very um, complicated. But this is also to illustrate that banking regulation is very complicated and very diverse. So here we see, we see the, an overview of the so-called Basel III reforms after 2008. 
So Basel, it's a city in Switzerland, but it's also um, the name of a group of people who, from, from around the world who, exactly, who, um, who try to give guidelines about how to optimally um, regulate banks. And I, I don't wanna go into details here, but just to give you a, a brief overview about the dimensions of how these, um, about how the Basel committee thinks about banking regulation. So we have these three um, big blocks in green. You, we have this one dimension called capital, then we have a dimension called liquidity. And then on the bottom right, we have so-called large exposures. And we are mostly going to talk about capital so let me just say one sentence on liquidity and large exposures. Um, liquidity, as we've seen before, can, can be an issue if a bank does not have enough liquidity, um, it can run into stress. Um, so the Basel committee um, provided two, two recommendations, the so-called liquidity coverage ratio should, should make sure that a bank has sufficient amount of, of liquid of very liquid assets such as central bank reserves. And then the, the Basel committee also recommends to, um, to fulfill a certain so-called net stable funding ratio, which basically says that a bank should pay attention to the liability side and to the maturity of their liability side. So think of one bank having mostly savings accounts and another bank having mostly short-term um, deposits, then you can think that the bank with many long-term savings account is less prone to bank runs because people cannot just transfer their money tomorrow. They need to, um, they need to wait until maturity or they have to go through the contract and, and um, pay additional fees um, to take their money off. Um, so these are these two, two liquidity um, dimensions that we're not going to talk more about today. And then on the bottom, we have this so-called large exposure um, dimension, which also has been motivated by the global financial crisis because it was obvious that some institutions per se does, do not look very risky, but for example, a large proportion of their assets is vis-a-vis -vis only a single entity. And then you get these domino effects and Basel recommends to, to thoroughly monitor these um, large exposures. Okay, and we're gonna talk uh, next then about um, capital. Capital is probably the most important dimension of, of banking regulation. And you see that there are the so-called three pillars of, of capital regulation. We're gonna talk about pillar one on the next slides. Uh, we're not gonna talk about uh, uh, pillar two and pillar three, uh, just one sentence on each. Pillar two is about um, individual supervisory um, management. So it basically, Basel basically recommends that if a bank has only exposure to, I don't know, shipment credits, um, then the regulator should charge, should force this bank to hold additional, um, additional capital reserves because it has such a high concentration risk. So it's, this is kind of an individual regulatory um, dimension. And then the third pillar called market discipline might be also very interesting for you if you want to have a closer look at what banks are doing. Here Basel recommends and most countries in the world have, um, the advanced countries have, have implemented um, these recommendations that banks disclose so they make some data um, about their health status publicly available. So these days you can Google any major bank um, you can type in disclosure Goldman Sachs and you will find a variety of key metrics regarding their liquidity and, and capital situation. And we will now talk about um, the capital dimension. Um, so why, maybe again, a bit more specific here, why do we, do we want to regulate bank capital? Um, so before, maybe it's one step back, before on our balance sheets, we have always seen seen this, this equity um, and capital is basically a broader term and equity is the best kind of, kind of capital. Um, and if you go, go back to, to the Basel discussions over the last de decades, a lot of, of the discussions are about what is bank capital actually? What should count as, 
capital? What kind of liability is um, are in such a way to absorb losses? As we've seen before, this equity gets hit immediately. If a bank defaults on some loans, then bank equity is, is hit first, but then they are for other financial instruments, you might have heard of COCOs, so-called convertible bonds, where a bank issues um, such a bond and in, in times of stress, this bond will be converted into equity um, and then also serve as a, as a buffer against, um, against losses. Uh, next slide again. So this was just a note on, on kind of the, the terminology here. And so I, here I want to make the point that banks have a tendency to hold too little capital and too much debt for two reasons. First, as we've seen before, banks' liabilities are, are our money and we, have, we value money a lot. It's something like a public good. There's less little alternative. And therefore, if you compare a bank to any other corporation or so, they have a huge advantage in terms of, um, of, of their debt structure. And then second, banks' debt holders are protected by an extensive um, safety net. Um, as we've seen before, there are explicit and implicit um, guarantees so that bank debt is, is perceived to be relatively um, stable. And, and, to, and to some extent, you don't have much of an alternative if you don't want to hold in, in most advanced economies, you don't have an, an alternative to having a bank account. It's kind of mandatory. And then more, more precisely on the bottom here, I want to make the point that the capital ratio that a bank would choose um, herself is, is not necessarily in line with the social optimal um, capital ratio. The first reason is that banks do not sufficiently price in all the externalities. Okay, a bank is not, not an ordinary corporation that if it goes bankrupt, um, people lose their job and, and a few other things happen, but that's it. But banks provide these, they, have, they provide payment infrastructure and they also have all these um, bank accounts and they provide credit to the real economy. So if a bank goes bankrupt, um, this can have huge externalities on the, on the real economy. Think of all, all the different companies that depend on a monthly basis on some liquidity, um, on some liquidity, some credit lines to, to pay, for example, wages, um, and they, they can be very badly um, hit. And then second, as, as mentioned before, the safety net causes a tendency of banks to hold um, too many liabilities. Of course, um, banks have an incentive themselves to hold um, capital. They don't want to go bankrupt immediately, but, but their, their incentives might not be um, in line with what is socially optimal. And on the next slide, I just um, again want to make this very simple uh, point comparing two banks on the left and on the right hand side. On the left, you have a bank with, with a lot of leverage. On the right, there's a bank with little leverage and now this yellow, um, yellow little monster here comes representing a default on some of these loans and the left bank goes bankrupt and the right bank is still um, solvent. So obviously equity can absorb losses and reduces the chance of, of distress. And then the question is um, how much capital is, is optimal? And maybe we're gonna um, jump over the next slide. And go two slides further. Yeah, let's skip this one. Exactly, so how much capital is is optimal, how, how, how much capital should a bank hold? So one very simple measure is to say, okay, we look at the total amount of assets indicated by a large B, by capital B, and then we look at all the equity indicated by capital A, divide A by B and say, this ratio has to be larger than 3%. Okay, obviously that's a very um, simple uh, measure. It can serve as a very good backstop against excessive leverage. If you look at many large banks before 2008, their leverage ratios went down and down. So they extended their balance sheets more and more. Um, risk managers said, yeah, we only have super, super safe assets. Um, there's, there's, there's no problem. We don't need more equity. 
But if you have super, super safe assets, seemingly, and then uh, a leverage ratio of only 2% or so, then a small shock to all these safe assets is already enough to, to make the bank um, insolvent. So the leverage ratio is a good backstop measure, but it may provide incentives for regulatory arbitrage. And what do I mean by regulatory arbitrage? Now imagine this bank here on the left has hit, hit the bound. So they have a leverage ratio of 3%. They can't grant any more loans, but still they might want to make more money. So they might have incentives that whenever somebody repays a safe loan, they're not going to extend another safe loan, but they might do crazy lending to Bitcoin um, speculators at high interest rates in order to try to boost their, um, to boost their income. So the leverage ratio is only kind of a very rough boundary around the whole, whole, um, the whole balance sheet. But it's obviously very poor when it comes to, to, the, to the risks that, that, are, that the bank takes within this, within this boundary. And therefore, as we can see on the next slide, um, regulators came up with the idea that you should assign an individual risk weight to, to every different asset position. Okay, so the idea is very simple. Um, imagine a bank providing very safe um, mortgages, then the regulator says, okay, they look very safe. Um, the, the house is worth 1 million. The, the household borrowed only 200,000 um, Swiss francs. That's very safe. You don't need to put a high risk weight on this. But if you provide an unsecured loan to a new startup company that does not even have any revenues, then you need, a higher, need to put a higher risk weight um, on this one. Okay, so I think the idea here is relatively intuitive. But again, then you have a huge uh, problem. Um, and this is how do you measure these risk weights and who measures them? Because the, the problem is that um, if, if, you, if, you, if you would take a, yeah, the, the problem is that banking business, banks might specialize in a variety of, of different dimensions. One bank might specialize in, in um, aero, aerospace lending. And then this bank can say, oh, my aerospace lending is so super safe. Planes never crash. We have a history of, of 40 years, no single default. We're going to put zero, zero risk weights on all our loans. That's super safe. And then another, um, another bank says, yeah, we are also super, super safe. But the regulators say, no, that's not, we don't really believe it. Something could happen. So it's, it's difficult how to measure these um, risk weights. And they're basically, in the current framework, two different approaches. Um, a bank can today calculate the risk weights using the so-called standardized approach. That's an approach where the Basel framework, they provide um, concrete numbers um, and you can go through long tables and check what kind of risk weight do I have to associate to say an unsecured corporate loan. Obviously these risk measures um, are very rough estimates and banks have been lobbying um, to, to, kind of, to, to kind of get around this standardized approach because they say our risk management is so good, our loans are so special, we are so safe. Um, these, these standardized risk measures are not suitable for us. And then therefore banks can also use the so-called internal ratings-based approach where banks use internal models to calculate their risk. Okay, so then the bank uses an internal time series of, of maybe 20 years, calculates the average probability of default for a mortgage loan um, and then translates this into a risk rate. So, so summing up, um, we see that, again, one slide back. Yeah, so the risk weighted assets is just the exposure times the risk rate. And then the current framework, the required capital is 8% of these risk weighted assets. Okay, next slide. And now I have a, um, question for you. Um, so the, and here we, now you imagine you're this chief risk officer of a, of a bank and um, in your jurisdiction, so in your country, um, the use of external ratings like uh, Standard & Poor's or Moody's, 
um, is allowed and the bank may base the risk weight using um, these external credit institutions. And on the bottom, you see a table translating the rating of an external a rating agency into the base uh, Basel risk weight. And the question is now, what is the minimum required regulatory capital for US dollar 12 million unsecured loan to a corporate with an external rating of BBB plus? Is it 9 million, 0 0.72 million or 12 million? And I would now give you two minutes to make the calculation on your own, if you want to. Can just uh, on a side note, I mean, after 2008, you have heard that you have probably heard that external rating agencies have also come under pressure for providing ratings that are not very um, accurate. Um, so this is another dimension of the complexity of banking regulations that is subject to um, subject to potential mis, mis mismeasurement. Okay, so what is the right answer? It's um, it's B, 0 0.72 million. How do you get there? Um, the exposure is 12 million. Um, then you, you look up the risk weight on the bottom. Triple B plus has a risk weight of 75%. So 75% of 12 million is 9 million. And then as we have seen on the slide before, your required capital is 8% of this total exposure. Um, which then gives you 0 0.72 um, million. Okay, next slide, please. So here I want to give you um, just a brief overview of, of where Basel comes from. So these, these Basel regulations, if we go all the way back to 1975, the idea of the G10, G10 countries was to, um, to regulate in particular banks that are internationally um, Active. In particular, regulators face the difficulty if Goldman Sachs is based in the United States but has a subsidiary in, in Germany. Who is responsible for for what for what kind of businesses that these banks um, do? And then the first big Basel Accord was in 1988, um, the so-called Basel One framework, where regarding credit risk, a standardized approach was introduced. So these, this internal model we, we've, I've mentioned before was not yet allowed, and but you only and you only had a small number of risk classes. So for example, no matter what kind of corporate loan you were providing, there was only one risk weight. Okay, and this is the, the kind of problem that I've mentioned before. Um, it's very inaccurate. So these these risk classes are not very um, risk sensitive. In, in addition, one of the, the disadvantages of, of the Basel I Accord was that credit risk mitigation techniques were used, so credit derivatives and, and swaps, which help banks seemingly mitigate their, their credit risk to reduce capital requirements, um, but, but the Basel framework did not um, take them into, into account. And then Basel II, and then in 1975, a market risk was added to these banks in our balance sheet so far, they were so simplified, we have not seen um, tr proprietary trading activities of banks. Investment banks are typical for having on the asset side a variety of, for example, different securities. And depending on the kind of securities you hold, the market risk amendment asks you to hold a certain amount of, of capital. And then in 2004, Basel II was introduced um, so the big change here was to introduce these internal rating based models. The literature argues whether they, this was a, a step forward or, 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 or maybe even um, um, backward because it's difficult to check these models. And empirically you've seen that many banks moving from the standardized approach to the in, 
to the internal rate-based models approach suddenly had way lower risk weights. Um, so they also obviously had some incentives to, to, to calibrate the internal models in a way to, to hold um, less, um, less capital. Another problem of Basel II was that the regulator did not think about pro-cyclicality. So imagine if you are in a 10, 20 years boom, boom period, all banks think, oh, this is super safe, we don't need capital, default rates are super low. Um, and then you build up leverage, you build up risk. And then if a crisis hits, the capital buffers are very small. So the bank is more likely to reduce lending to the real economy. And so you have a, a pro-cyclicality um, effect that was to some extent then addressed by Basel III. Basel III started in 2010 and basically tries to incorporate the lessons learned by the global financial um, crisis. And the, the key elements here was to introduce liquidity standards, capital buffers that try to um, avoid the pro-cyclicality and also implement a so-called output floor. Because as I've just mentioned, many banks switching from the standardized approach to the internal model, um, they suddenly said, oh, we are super risk-free. Um, and so as we can see on the next slide, Um, Basel implemented so, a so-called output floor on total risk-weighted assets. So what does this mean? It means that Basel allows a bank to use their own models, but only up to a certain point. It basically says that if you're using your own models and your own models say, oh, we need 0% risk weights and the standardized approach says you need 80%, then that's, so, um, that's not very credible. We're gonna put a floor, okay? And then I have, so in this context, I have another question for you. Um, assuming a bank's total risk-weighted assets calculated using the internal models is US dollar 80 million and using the standardized approach it's 100 million. So what would be the bank's final risk-weighted assets? Is it A, 72.5, B, 80, or C, 100 million? I'll give you one more minute and then we will move on to some COVID, human is talking about COVID. Okay, in this case, the answer is relatively easy. It's B, it's 80 million because the floor is not really binding. Does this make sense? Uh, somebody asked a question. Yeah, you, you can, if you want, you can answer in the chat, then I can see whether, <laughs> whether, you're, whether you're rather right or not, so, or not so right. So now I already gave the answer, it's, it's 80 million. We're gonna have one final question uh, in a few minutes. And then you're also happy to type your answer in the chat to see whether you need more time or less. <laughs> okay, so next slide. So I'll just very briefly now, um, spend the last 10 minutes or so on, on, on COVID. Next slide, please. So you're all familiar with um, probably what happened on financial markets. On the left-hand side, you see how stock prices collapsed in March um, and they have recovered to some extent. And on the right-hand side, you see, the, you see government bond yields. So government bonds are typically seen to be, to be a safe asset, but then in, in this gray period, which is March 11 to March 23, um, government bond yields went up. This, this means that government bond prices went down. So in these times, market participants were even trying to sell government bonds. Okay, why were they trying to sell government bonds? Cash was king. Everybody was trying to, to, get, um, to get deposits, to get money, and money was so scarce for um, for a few days that, that even government's bonds were not perceived to be um, very safe anymore. Um, next slide. So I'll just um, very briefly as an, as an overview about how to think about the COVID-19 crisis from a financial um, stability perspective. You might have a first phase where everybody is under stress, uncertainty is very high, Everybody tries to, to get liquidity. Um, 
central banks pumped a lot of liquidity into markets, um, loosened, they loosened this pressure and some macro prudential regulation was also um, loosened. For example, these capital buffers that I mentioned before that were introduced with Basel III, um, many jurisdictions abandoned them to give banks more, um, more leeway. And then the second phase, something that you could, I mean, it's very simplified framework, something you could call a rescue phase where the government stepped in. Um, in a third phase, um, a phase we are probably currently still, still in to some extent um, until maybe we have a vaccine. Um, we have the problem that people behaviors and the economy changes. So you have structural changes um, going on where one interesting question is to what extent um, are bank balance sheets safe? So banks have a lot of loans, for example, to, to aerospace, to the aerospace industry. And if nobody's flying anymore, then the question is how, how, how many loans on how many banks are in danger? Or you have the, um, um, you have many other industry like restaurants and, and the event industry that is also um, hit very hard. And the question is, to what extent did they depend on external funding and are these banks um, under stress. Yeah, we could probably talk more about these issues in the discussion. I would like to move on to the, to the next slide. My final question to you. Um, one of the key measures that many governments around the world implemented was to basically guarantee, guarantee for, for loans. So before we had this example of, of a 12 million US dollar unsecured loan to a corporation, um, and now we suppose that the corporation's rating has been downgraded because of the COVID impact, revenues are going down, but at the same time, the national government with a risk rate of 0% extended a guarantee um, to loans um, of certain sectors of the economy. And this corporate is part of this sector. And the government guarantee covers the full amount of the loan. So the question is, what is the minimum required regulatory capital for the loan? Is it zero, 0 0.72 million or 0 0.96 million? And, and you're free um, to, to type your answer in the chat. Okay, so again, so this, this, this loan has already granted, this company is struggling a lot. And now the government says, we're gonna, we're gonna take over the whole risk. We're gonna guarantee, we're gonna guarantee for this loan. Okay. Be more, more answers in the chat. Just gonna wait for one. Or maybe one more answer. <laughs> so, so re remember the, the basic idea that that regulatory capital, a bank needs to hold regulatory capital if it bears risks. And in this case, then the government takes over all the risks. So the loan is still on the balance sheet of the bank, but the risk is with the government, therefore, Answer A is correct. Um, there's zero regulatory capital that the bank needs for this kind of loan. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. And this is, a, this is exactly um, probably the most important measure that has been implemented in, in Switzerland. In Switzerland, so-called COVID-19 credits secured by the Confederation where accessible between the end of March and the end of July. There were two, kind, two, two kinds of loans, the COVID-19 credit up to 500K and the COVID-19 credit um, for volumes over 500K. And this, the smaller one is as in our example, 100% secured by the Confederation at a 0% interest rate. Um, and the duration has just been extended to I think several years now. And then these the second, the second credit plus um, 
extends to volumes over 500,000 Swiss francs. Um, and here the bank does a more comprehensive audit. So for all these small loans, it was really within a day, you got 500,000 Swiss francs. You had to fill in um, one, one paper formula um, and the bank checked whether you're a real company or not. And then they gave you the money. This was really a very quick unbureaucratic measure of, of liquidity. It's um, where the Federation now is relatively um, I'm proud of for the kind of speed with which it was implemented for the COVID plus credits banks also did some bank audit because only 85% um, was secured. And as of, uh, I think, two, three weeks ago, the total volume of these loans were around 17 billion, which amounts to around 3.7% of, of GDP. So quite, quite, an, um, quite a number. And on the next slide, we can, we can illustrate what would you be interested in? So we're now interested, is this a good measure or a bad measure? And there are kind of three, three things happening um, in, the last, in the last months. Some banks provide new COVID-19 credit on the left-hand side that is guaranteed by the government. Some banks might also provide ordinary credit. So what you've seen in many countries in the early, early times of the stress that corporations they just drew their credit lines. Okay, typically if you're a large corporation, you go to your bank and you ask them, what is my limit? How much money would you give me in, in total? And then uh, Goldman Sachs says, okay, you can get up to 50 million. And then you're the corporation, you say, okay, for now I only need 20. But whenever you want, you can, you can call them and you get another 30 million. And that's what many corporations did in these early days because uns unsecure, uh, um, uncertainty was very high. So you also have potentially a lot of new so-called ordinary credit. And then the third, the third thing that can happen is the repayment of, of credit. And what could obviously go, go wrong with such a measure is that it produces some kind of moral hazard. No? Because if you are um, a company and you have some loans where you pay a lot of interest rates or so, you might have an incentive to use the COVID loan to repay your old debt, um, which is not allowed, but there was some fraud. Um, I think the, the overall, we're still gonna see whether this um, measure, to what extent it was um, successful. And now I would like to jump, jump the next slide. So is it okay if I speak for five more minutes, Andrea? Yes. Okay, we have time. Okay, we're gonna skip um, this measure. And next slide. And I directly want to show you um, the, another very important measure in Switzerland, namely the foreign exchange interventions. Um, as you know, the Swiss franc is seen as a kind of safe haven um, currency and in times of stress, many people rush into the Swiss francs, so they buy Swiss francs, which leads to an appreciation of the Swiss franc. And as you can see here in this graph, these are the side deposits of the Swiss National Bank. So the Swiss National Bank has been trying to, to counteract this upward pressure of the Swiss franc for, for almost um, 12 years now. So whenever somebody goes to the foreign exchange market and says, I want to have Swiss francs because they are so safe and, um, and I like Switzerland, then the Swiss National Bank is basically printing in a digital way, new Swiss francs. And the amount, the overall volume is what you can see here in, in, in yellow. And you see that roughly 100 billion additional Swiss francs were created between early this year and, and now. So an interesting um, question for you might be, how does this foreign exchange intervention affect the balance sheet of, of Swiss banks? Because Swiss banks have the accounts at the Swiss National Bank. So whenever the, the Swiss National Bank intervenes here on the foreign exchange market, um, this, the side deposits of Swiss banks in aggregate increase by the same amount. So put differently, the increase in the balance sheet of the Swiss National Bank here also leads to an increase um, of the balance sheet of, of banks. 
And this might have been one motivation why, on the next slide, why the Financial Market Authority decided to give a temporary exemption of central bank deposits from the calculation of the leverage ratio. Okay, so remember before I told you that the leverage ratio um, simplified um, is just the amount of equity divided by the total amount of, of assets. But then in, in March, the um, Financial Market Authority, FINMA, announced that banks can now exclude central bank reserves from the calculation. Okay, now imagine that if the Swiss National Bank intervenes a lot on the foreign exchange market, then this blue, this blue bar here increases a lot together with, um, with the green bar. So the overall balance sheet gets larger. And if now banks are allowed to exclude the Swiss National Bank reserves, um, then the leverage ratio um, will, not, will not decline due to, um, due to this effect. It's a temporary measure. Um, I think people will look at it in detail whether it was necessary, to what extent it, it did help the Swiss banking um, system, but in any case, it will um, run out towards the end of this year. And as of, as of next year, banks have to include these um, reserves again. Which brings me, if you again jump over the next slide to the last slide, which, which brings me to the, to the end of my um, presentation. So I hoped I could give you some basic ideas about why, why are banks important, what is special about banks, and why do we regulate them. And I hope that you also got an idea about how complex banking regulation is. And to some extent, how, um, how dynamic it was over the last decades or, or hundreds of years. So many of these liquidity and solvency problems come up again and again. History seems to um, repeat itself. So a, a valid question is definitely Basel III, what lasts a long time finally becomes good, or are we, are we gonna have Basel IV, Basel V, Basel VI? <laughs> um, and another dimension that we, we could discuss about are, are the COVID-19 measures in, in relation to infrastructural um, power. And because many, many countries were wondering how, how can we support the economy? How can we support households? How can we sort of support companies? And of course, then banks are a natural candidate because they have the infrastructure. Every company has a banking account, but there might also be um, downsides um, to the reliance of, 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 uh, of the banking sector. And then an interesting dimension, this is something that I've, I've, I've talked about briefly before is, is and what now a lot of research globally is about is, is about these so-called zombie firms because over the globe now corporate debt, so firm loans are increasing a lot. In many countries you have, you have public guarantees for corporate loans and the question is, default rates in some countries for corporate loans are already going down. Um, so you can say that these COVID measures helped companies survive who would not otherwise have been able to survive. Um, so this is definitely an interesting area of, of, of discussion right now. And other discussion <clears throat> globally is, is, the, is about fiscal space because governments borrowed a lot. They gave a lot of guarantees and do they have to pay it back or not and when? <clears throat> and then the third dimension is also now very, very important in, in my opinion, because the first surveys and first data globally suggest that COVID measures do have significant distributional effects. So, so, so what I've seen so far is that, that people who work in, in the IT, finance or insurance industry, <clears throat> they can very easily work from home and they, they have benefited to some extent even from um, <clears throat> from these COVID measures, whereas many other many other um, sectors of the economy um, have have suffered, and the inequality seems to seems to widen globally. And yeah, maybe the last question, ad addressing it to you, um, how do you think COVID has affected and, and will affect the economy and the financial sector? What what kind of experiences do you have for, from your country um, and with home office and with them? Um, this webinar instead of going to a lecture. Um, 
Okay, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions or, or feedback. <laughs>